Chapter 15, we're going to deal with the autonomic nervous system and the visceral reflexes. Now we've already covered the various subdivisions of the nervous system such as the CANS and the PNS and now we're going to cover the autonomic nervous system which is a subdivision or another division of the PNS and of course in all the subdivisions that are involved in the um, autonomic nervous system. Within the lecture you hear me refer to autonomic system as the A and S. So please keep that in mind as we go through. So the autonomic nervous system can be defined as a motor, ner motor nervous system that controls glands, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. It is also called the visceral motor system. To be distinguished it um, to distinguish it from the somatic motor system that controls the uh, skeletal muscle. Now its primary target muscles are the viscera of the thoracic and the abdominal pelvic cavities and some structures of the body wall including blood vessels, sweat glands, and pyoerector muscles. When we refer to the visceral motor body, we're looking at organs in the cavities of the body, especially in the abdominal cavity. Now, um, the ANS, it usually carries out its actions involuntary, so that's without any conscious con consciousness or awareness. Looking at, for example, our blood vessels with a chain size with the vasodilation, vasoconstriction, even when our heart is beating faster, that's involuntary control. Now the visceral effectors do not depend on the ANS to function but only to adjust their acting, their activity, sorry, to changing needs. Now if the ANS needs to cardiac or smooth muscles, sorry, if the ANS um, nerves to the cardiac or the smooth muscles are severed, then the muscle is going to exhibit um, exaggerated responses and that's what is called the denervation hypersensitivity. Now the ANS is, is responsible for visceral reflexes and that is unconscious automated stereotype responses to um, stimulation much like somatic reflexes but involving visceral receptors and effectors. Um, when we look at the visceral reflex arc, we have certain things that are coming to play. We have receptors, we have afferent neurons, we have interneurons, efferent neurons, and effectors. Now the effectors, um, they have, they are nerve endings that are, that detect the stretch the tissue damage, blood chemicals, um, body temperature, and other any other um, internal stimuli. The afferent neurons are the ones that lead to the CNS. Then we have the interneuron, which is found within or that lies lies um, within the CNS. Then we have our efferent. Those are the ones that carry the motor signals away from the CNS. Then we have our effectors, which are going to make the adjustment so that we can make the proper response. Now, an example of someone suffering from high blood pressure is, um, is an example that, that your book gives uh, for figure 15.1. And we're going to look at the various activities that occur with the visceral reflexes. Now if a person is suffering from high blood pressure, it's going to be detected by these various bare receptors um, in the um, carotid artery, the common carotid artery, and of course in the aorta. Now these signals are transmitted via the, the glucopharyngeal nerve to the medulla oblongata, found right here in the brainstem. Now, the medulla is going to integrate the information 
and then send signals via the vagus nerve back to the heart. And these signals are going to slow the heart down so that it can reduce blood pressure. This is an example of homeostatic negative feedback loop. So when you get a chance, make sure you go over the few steps what happens with a homeostatic negative feedback loop. Now the ANS has two subdivisions. It has um, a somatic and a sorry a sympathetic and a parasympathetic division. Now these two divisions often um, innervate the same target organs and have cooperative or contrasting effects. The sympathetic division it increases alertness, heart rate, blood pressure, pulmonary air flow, um, blood glucose concentration, and blood flow to muscles while reducing blood flow to the skin and the digestive tract. The parasympathetic has a more of a common effect on, on the body's functions and it's associated with reduced energy expenditure and normal bodily maintenance. So we're going to look at it as the resting and the digesting state. Now normally both symptoms um, are active spontaneously, exhibit a background rate of activity called autonomic tone. And that shifts from one to the other depending on the individual's needs. Now um, either division has universally excitatory or common effect. So when we look at the parasympathetic tone, um, it's going to maintain the, the smooth muscle tone in the intestines. Then it's going to, it, it holds the resting heart rate down to about uh, to 70 to 80 beats per minute. But the parasympathetic, um, it keeps most blood vessels partially constricted and maintains the, um, the blood pressure. Now the sympathetic division of the ANS um, Hold on a second. Okay. So in terms of the neural pathways, the ANS has components in both the CNS and the PNS. The ANS includes uh, nuclei in the hypothalamus and other brainstem regions motor neurons in the spinal cord um, and the uh, peripheral ganglia and nerve fibers that travel through the cranial and the spinal nerves. The autonomic motor pathways differs um, significantly from somatic motor pathways. In the somatic motor pathway, a motor neuron in the brainstem or the spinal cord extends a myelinated axon all the way to the um, skeletal muscle. But in the autonomic pathway, um, the signals travel, um, the, tra the signal must travel across two neurons just to reach the target, a gland or a smooth muscle cell, and must cross synapse uh, where these two neurons must meet in the autonomic ganglia, ganglion. So let's take a look at this diagram. Here we have the somatic pathway. And we see that it's just um, one motor neuron from the CNS to the particular target muscle. But with the autonomic, F, with the autonomic pathway, you're going to have two neurons, which will have one will be our preganglion um, pre neuron and our postganglion neuron. And of course, it is um, it must cross the synapse where these two neurons are going to meet, and they're going to meet in the autonomic ganglion. So in this first neuron, the preganglion neuron, it has a soma in the brainstem or the spinal cord, and an axon that terminates in the ganglia. So here we have the axon is going to terminate right here in the ganglia. Um, but then the post, um, the post ganglion, ganglion, sorry, neuron, um, 
their axon is going to extend from this um, autonomic ganglion to the target cells. Now unlike the somatic motor neurons, the pulse ganglion fibers of the ANS do not synapse with specific targets but with a chain of um, Bacosia, uh, with varicocytes um, stimulating many cells simultaneously. All right, so we're going to look at the semantic division of the ANS. It's also called the thoracolumnar division because it arises from the, the thoracic and the lumbar regions of the spinal cord, hence the name. The pregangent um, neurons are in the lateral horns and nearby regions of the gray matter of the spinal cord. Now their fibers exit by way of the spinal nerves, T1, thoracic 1, and L2, lumbar 2, and then they lead to the sympathetic chain of the ganglia which are um, interconnected by longitudinal cords. Now the number of ganglia varies but usually there are approximately three in the thoracic in the, on the cervical we have 11 in the thoracic, four in the lumbar, four in the sacral, and one in the coccygeal ganglion. Now the, um, the nerve cords from the thoracic region ascend to the ganglia in the neck cords, in the neck and cords from the lumbar region um, descend to the sacral coccygeal ganglia. And generally, the head receives the sympathetic output from spinal cord segment T1, the neck from the neck from T2, the thoracic, the thoracic, um, the thoracic and upper limbs from T3 to T6, um, the abdominal from T7 to T11, and the lower limbs from T12 uh, to T to L2. So here we had different divisions. We in uh, green we have the cervical. The blue region is our thoracic, the pinkish looking region is our lumbar, and the orange is our sacrum. So these outputs, the, the sympathetic outputs, these are the segments that I was referring to with our, our T1, which is um, output from the spinal cord. And of course T2, we're going to have output um, from the neck to the T, T2. The thoracic and the upper lumbar, that's from uh, T3. And um, yeah, T3 to T6. And then the abdominal, the abdomen is from T7 to T11. Thoracic 7, thoracic 11. And the lower limbs from T, thoracic 12 to lumbar 2. Those are lumbar 2 and lumbar 7 in our thoracic. Now in the um, the thoracolumnar region, each pair of vertical ganglia is connected to a spinal nerve by two branches called the communicating rami. Now the pregangliate fibers are small myelinated fibers that travel from the spinal nerves to the ganglia by way of the of the white communicating ramus. The pulse ganglion fibers, which are unmyelinated, leave the ganglia by way of the gray communicating ramus and extend to the target. So here we have um, our, the soma of the pre-ganglion neuron. And these fibers are going to travel from the spinal nerves to the ganglia, which we see right here. And this section here is called the white ramus. This is, and over here is our, is our gray ramus. And these two combined is that communicating ramming. 
over here, you see the postsynaptic fibers, which we already said, stated that they're unmyelinated, and they're going to leave the ganglia. There's one section here, another one here, and they're going to leave the gang ganglia by the gray communicating ramus and then exit and then extend to whichever target muscle they're going to go to, whether it's the liver, the spleen, the kidneys, or even the reproductive, the reproductive system. Now after entering the sympathetic chain, the preganglion fibers may follow only three courses. That is, um, or, or three routes. Now um, some end in the, gang, in the ganglion and the synapse immediately with the postganglion neuron. Some travel up and down. They go up and down. Uh, the chain and the synapse and the ganglia at other levels. And these fibers are the only route by which the ganglia at the cervical, the, the um, sacral, and the coccygeal levels will actually receive their input. And some pass through the chain without synapsing and continue as continue as the, um, the, splintic, the splenic um, nerves. Now the nerve fibers that lead the sympathetic chain by the three routes, by three particular routes, sorry, it's the spinal nerve route, the sympathetic, and the the splen splenic nerves nerve route. Now, in the spinal nerve route, um, some postganglion fibers they're going to exit the ganglia. We have here they're going to exit the ganglia by way of the gray ramus. They're going to return to the nerve. To the spinal nerve or the subdivisions and then travel to the rest of the um, body to the rest of the way to the particular target so here it is leaving the ganglia and um, they're going to leave it by way of the gray ramus the gray and white ramus and then they're going to travel the rest of the way to whichever target muscle that they're going to to effect, well, it's the um, the pilorectal muscles or even the blood vessels. In the sympathetic nerve route, the postganglion fibers they leave by way of the sympathetic nerves that extend to the thoracic um, viscera. They form a a um, carotid uh, plexus around each carotid artery and extend fibers from there to ex to effectors in the head. Looking at sweat glands, I mean, looking at sweat, salivary, um, nasal glands, pilorectal, blood vessels, and of course, um, dilators of the iris. Now, some fibers from form the cardiac nerves to the heart. Now, in the um, oh, here's just a diagram of the sympathetic um, nerve route. I will see the gray and white ramus, and of course we see the spinal cord here, and they're going to leave the ganglia, and these are going to be traveling up and down the, the various, travel um, up and down the chain and the synapse in the ganglia. And that's our example of the sympathetic nerve route. Here is our um, splenic, splenic uh, nerve route. Now some fibers that arise from, they have some fibers, they're going to arise from the spinal nerves, thoracic 5 and 2, thoracic 12, and they're going to pass through the ganglia without synapsing and continue as um, splenic, as a splenic nerves. And this is going to lead, these lead to second, to a second set of ganglia called the collateral we have here the uh, the collateral or the pre vertebral ganglia where uh, they're synapse with the post ganglions so here's the the um, the collateral ganglia where you're going to have the second set of ganglia um, meeting and they're going to synapse here with the post ganglia um, neurons which will eventually 
um, go towards the target muscles, the adrenal gland or the intestines. Um, the collateral ganglia it contributes to the abdominal aortic plexus, which has three major collateral ganglia. The, um, the celiac, the superior uh, mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric. Now some um, authorities are going to use the term solar plexus for, um, for celiac and superior mesenteric ganglion and others are going to use the term um, um, celiac ganglion, ganglion only. Now the post ganglion fibers, they, they accompany their arteries and their, and their branches to their target muscles. All right, so there's no simple one-to-one -one relationship between the pregangliate and the postgangliate neurons in the sympathetic division. Now, both neural and convergence, both um, both neural and neural convergence and neural divergence are present. Now, one postsynaptic cell receives a convergent input from a number of different presynaptic cells, and um, any individual neuron can make divergent connections to many different presynaptic cells. Divergence, it allows one neuron to communicate with many other neurons in the network. Convergence just allows neurons to receive input from many um, neurons in a network. When uh, dealing with um, divergence, it predominates and each preganglionate uh, cell branches and synapses um, on 10 to 20 postganglionate cells. Now, one preganglionate neuron can excite multiple postganglionate fibers, leading to different target organs, and they have relatively widespread effect. So here we're going to look at the adrenal glands. It's a pair that lays on top of the superior pole of the of the kidneys. These are adrenal gland. Now, each gland is actually two glands with different functions and embryonic origins. The adrenal cortex is a cross-section of our adrenal gland and we're going to see there is an adrenal cortex and there is an adrenal medulla. The adrenal cortex is the one that's going to secrete our steroid hormones. So we're looking at androgens and aldosterone and our cortisol. The adrenal medulla, which is the inner core, it is um, essentially a sympathetic ganglion and the sympathetic nervous system and the adrenal medulla are referred to collectively as a simple um, sympathal, sympathal adrenal system. Now this adrenal medulla it consists of modified postganglion neurons without dendrites or axons and it's going to secrete um, hormones into the bloodstream such as our catecholamines um, two of the three catecholamines. We have 85% um, epinephrine and 15% norepinephrine. Okay, and they're also used as neurotransmitters. Now, the parasympathetic division of the ANS is also called the craniosacral division because it arises from the brain and the sacral region of the brain of the spinal cord. Its fibers are going to travel in certain cranial and sacral nerves. Now, so much of the preganglionate neurons are in the mid brain, the pons, the medulla oblongata, and segments um, S2 and S4 of the spinal cord. Now their long preganglionate fibers, they end in the terminal ganglia in or near the particular target or, um, organ. There's much, not much less neural um, divergence in the parasympathetic division than in the sympathetic division. We look at neurodivergence. 
um, to expand on it a little more, it's uh, where we have one preganic fiber. It's going to reach their target their target organ, and then it's going to stimulate fewer than five postgangliate cells. So now we're going to look at the cranial nerves. You have five cranial nerves that leave the brain stem. We have the ocular motor nerve, number three, our CN nerve. CN we're referring to cranial nerve number three. So CN3 is our ocular, mo ocular motor nerve. CN4, CN7 um, is our facial nerve. Um, glossopharyngeal nerve is our CN9. And our vagus nerve is our CN10. So hopefully you guys remember um, how to read Roman numerals. Um, now for the first one, our CN number three, this nerve is going to carry parasympathetic, parasympathetic fibers that control the lenses and the um, pupils of the eyes. It has preganglionate fibers and they're going to enter the orbit. So let's find this um, ocular motor nerve. Here's our preganglionate fiber. I mean, our, yeah, our preganglionate fiber, the green one here. And those are going to enter the orbit and then terminate at the ciliar ganglia. So here's the ciliar ganglia, and it's right behind the eye. And it's going to synapse here with the postganglionate fibers. They're going to enter the eyeball and innervate the, the ciliary the ciliary muscle and the popular contract constrictor. Now we have the facial nerve, which is our number, hope you guys remember, number seven. Here we have the facial nerve. The facial nerve is going to carry parasympathetic fibers that are going to regulate the tears, the tear glands, the salivary glands, and the nasal glands. Now, after it leaves uh, the facial, after the facial nerve is going, um, after the facial nerve emerges from the pond, which we have here, the parasympathetic fiber is going to split and form two branches. Now, the upper branch, which we call here, is called the the pterygoid palatine ganglion, right here at the top. And this one um, is going to synapse with the postganglionate neuron fibers and then continue to the tear glands, nasal glands, and other areas of the oral cavity. The lower branch is um, the lower branch. It crosses the mid air cavity and ends at the submandibular ganglion near the angle of the medulla. The postganglionate fibers supply uh, salivary glands in the floor of the mouth. The, fourth, the third um, cranial, cranial nerve, our C9, it's our glossopharyngeal nerve. This one uh, carries parasympathetic fibers um, concerned with just salivation. So here's our glossopharyngeal um, plus pharyngeal nerve. Um, when it comes to the preganglionic fiber that leaves the nerve, it gets close to its origin, and then it forms the the tympanic nerve, which is a continuation uh, cross. A continuation crosses the the middle air cavity and ends in the optic ganglia near ganglion near the form the foramen um, oval. Now the post synaptic nerve of C N nine is going to then follow the trigeminal nerve to the parotid salivary glands. The final cranial nerve, our number uh, 10, is our vagus nerve. 
This nerve carries about 90% of all parasympathetic preganglion fibers. It travels down the neck and forms three networks in the mediastinum of the chest. Right. The cardiac plexus. The cardiac plexus extends fire it supplies fibers to the heart. So here's our cardiac plexus. It's going to supply these fibers to our heart. The pulmonary plexus. The extend fibers that are going to occupy the bronchi, the blood vessels, into the lungs. The esophageal plexus. This supplies fibers that are going to um, regulate swallowing. Okay. Now at the end of the esophagus, these plexus are going to branch off anteriorly and posteriorly um, to the vagal trunks, now each of which contain fibers from both the right and left vagus nerves. Now these branches are going to contribute to abdominal aortic to abdominal aortic plexus. So you see we here we have the um, the esophageal plexus at the end of that. Here we have our um, here where the plexus is going to give off to anterior and posterior, so that's in the front and the back vagal trunks. And then each are going to contain these fibers from both the right and left vagus nerves. And they're going to help contribute to the um, abdominal aortic plexus. Now we have the sympathetic fiber synapse in the aortic plexus while the um, parasympathetic fibers are going to pass through and synapse in the, in, in the terminal ganglia near the abdominal cavity, um, organ, sorry. Now the, the remaining parasympathetic fibers arise from levels S2 to S4 of the spinal cord. These fibers that travel a short distance in the um, anterior rami, rami of the spinal nerves and then form pelvic splintic nerves that lead to the in inferior hypogastric plexus. Some fibers synapse here, but some but some must pass through and travel via plexus nerves to the terminal ganglia in um, target organs. Now, um, the digestive tract, it has a nervous system of its own, the inner, the enteric system, nervous system, the enteric nervous system, E-N-T-E-R-I-C, nervous system. It does not arise from the brainstem or the spinal cord, but it does innervate smooth muscle and glands. It consists of about 100 million neurons embedded in the wall of the digestive tract. It regulates the um, motility of the esophagus, stomach, and intestines, and the secretion of digestion enzymes and acid. For normal function, these digestive activities also require sympathetic and parasympathetic regulation. So when we look at uh, mega colon, it's an insight that you have in your book, Insight 15.1. This talks about mega colon and it briefly goes over what it is and what causes it. Um, I dug up a little more information for you guys, so you might, not, you may, might need to write it down. Um, the mega colon. It is an abdominal, an abnormal, sorry, massive dilation of the bowel, accompanied by abdominal distension and chronic constipation. So here you see, right here on the in this particular diagram, you see that it is distending. Of course, it's going to cause um, chronic constipation. It's also accompanied by paralysis of the peristaltic movements of the bowel. So hopefully peristaltic is, is dealing with the wave-like movements of, of um, feces or 
food um, along the particular track. Now, um, in extreme cases, uh, the feces are going to consolidate in hard masses inside the colon. And that's called fecalomas. Fe fecalomas. F E C A L O M A S. Which can require surgery to remove. Now, human colon is considered abnormally enlarged if it has a diameter greater than 12 centimeters in the cecum because a normal one is, is, is less than 9 centimeters. Also, if it's greater, if the rectal sigmoid is greater than 6.5 centimeters and if the ascending colon is greater than 8 centimeters. Now what are some symptoms? I mentioned one already. You're going to have chronic constipation. It's going to be up for a very long duration. You'll have abdominal bloating, abdominal tenderness, and excessive gas, which is called um, tympany, T-Y-M-P-A-N-Y. We have abdominal pain. You'll have um, when, the, when the physician starts to palpate um, the area, they'll feel these hard fecal masses. The person will suffer from, from fever. They'll have a low blood potassium rate potassium concentration or levels to have tachycardia tachycardia meaning an increased heart rate and they also may suffer from shock but then you have those are that are um, life-threatening complications and that's when they have um, colonic gangrene you have um, perforation of the of the bowel and of course you have um, bacteria infection it also goes on to say that um, her, her sprung disease is um, a cause from from is is one of the causes for um, from megacolon, and it's usually evident in newborns who fail to have their very first bowel movement, and it affects uh, four times as many infant boys as it do as girls, and um, it's not the only cause of megacolon. But we do can get it from depending on um, maybe a third world country where you have um, kissing buds that may be transmitted, that may transmit parasites to the humans, and then of course with that bite it can destroy the autonomic ganglion of the enteric nervous system, leading to um, gangrene in the mega colon. So how can different autonomic neurons have different effects? So this is constricting some blood vessels but dilating others. There's two fundamental reasons. We have the parasympathetic and the parasympathetic fibers. They'll secrete different neurons. Now the target cells, they respond to some neurotransmitter differently depending on the type of the receptor that they, that, that, um, that they have for it. For example, dopamine. Dopamine can be used to um, increase sodium secretion by the kidneys, but it also can um, vasodilate the the um, the blood vessels. Now, acetylcholine and or norepinephrine are two major um, neurotransmitters of the ANS. And why is that? It's because they are secreted by all neuro um, autonomic fibers. Now, um, acetylcholine is secreted by the preganglionic neurons in both divisions and by the postganglionic neurons of the, of the parasympathetic division and a few sympathetic postganglionic neurons. And the ace, um, acetylcholine was discovered by Otto Louis. Now, um, a nerve fiber that secretes um, acetylcholine is called a... Um, Cholineric, cholinergic, sorry, a cholinergic fiber, and any fiber that binds to it is called a cholinergic receptor. So we have the cholinergic fiber, 
which is uh, the fiber that will secrete the acetylcholine and we have the receptor is where the um, is the receptor that it that it binds to um, the two categories of cholinergic cholinergic receptors are um, muscarinic receptors and nicotinic receptors the very first one the muscarinic receptors are named for muscarine muscarine sorry a mushroom um, toxin used in their discovery now some muscarine receptors there um, they lead to excita excitation and others lead to inhibition inhibition they are involved with second messenger symptoms systems the nicotinic receptors they're named after nicotine a um a type of toxin a botanical toxin they occur at all synapses in the autonomic ganglia and the binding of the acetylcholine to the nicotine <laughs> nicotinic receptor is always excitatory so they open the ligate the ligand gated ion channels to produce excitatory postsynaptic um, potentials the neuro the norepinephrine is secreted by nearly all the sympathetic postganglionic neurons they're also called the adrenergic fibers now nerve fibers that secrete um, norepinephrine are called adre adre adrenergic fibers and the receptors are called adrenergic uh, receptors. Now there are two types of those receptors. You have a beta and you have an alpha. The alpha ones are um, usually have excitatory effects but not always. There are like two subclasses of the alpha. There's an alpha 1 receptor and you have an alpha 2. The alpha 1 receptor are su suppresses the synthesis of C AMP, which is our cyclic um, adenosine mon uh, monophosphate, and whereas the the alpha two receptors, they're going to employ calcium ions as a second messenger. Now, our beta receptors, they're usually inhibitory, but not always. There are also two subclasses. You have a beta one and a beta two, and they're going to mediate different effects but both act through the cyclic AMP. So here we have an example of our, of our parasympathetic nerve fiber and we have our sympathetic nerve fiber here. So you can see in the, um, in the diagram that with the adrogenic fiber they're going to be um, responsible for um, excitation and releasing of the norepinephrine here we have the norepinephrine um, ready for the particular target cell in the colony, they're going to be releasing acetylcholine. Okay. Here for the particular target cell. So the receptors would be the cholinergic receptor, and of course the fiber is our cholinergic fiber, and that's the fiber that's going to release the acetylcholine for the particular. Um, receptors. Now, the autonomic effects on the glandular secretion are often an indirect result of their effect on um, blood vessels. You know, it's going to increase or decrease in blood flow affects the um, ganglion secretion accordingly. Now, the sympathetic 
effects tend to last longer than the parasympathetic effects. You have the acetylcholine from the parasympathetic fiber is quickly broken down by the acetyl, um, acetyl, acetylcholine esterase. Let's see if I can go back to the other slide for you guys. If you can see what's going on here. Um, so the acetylcholine uh, from the parasympathetic fiber is quickly broken down by the acetylcholine esterase and it, its effects um, last only a few seconds. And the norepinephrine from the sympathetic fiber has a number of fates. Some is reabsorbed by the nerve fiber where it is reused or is broken down by the mon monoamine ox oxidase, MOA, MAO. Some are going to diffuse into adjacent tissues where it is degraded by CM COMT. This is a uh, catechol O methan methyl transferase. Methyl transferase. Much of and then much of it is passed into the bloodstream where it circulates through the body and has a prolonged effect. Now the ANS also employs other um, neurotransmitters. Many fibers are going to secrete neuropeptid, neuropeptids that uh, modulate um, acetylcholine and the norepinephrine. The sympathetic fibers, they may secrete uh, substance P, um, somatostatin, um, neurotensin. They're going to secrete those. And some parasympathetic, parasympathetic fibers, they're going to release um, nitric oxide which allows blood vessels to dilate. Now, most visceral have dual inter intervation, sorry, innervation. That is, is that they receive nerve fibers from both sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. These divisions may have either antagonistic or cooperative effects on a single organ. Okay, I kind of jumped ahead of myself just a little bit, but um, before I go on or I go over that, let me deal with this slide here, slide 1533. Now, the autonomic effects on the glandular secretion are often an indirect result of their effects on the blood vessels. So they're going to have this dual innervation. Okay, you're going to have vasodilation, um, but you're going to increase blood flow and secrete and increase secretion. And in your vasoconstriction, they're going to decrease blood flow or decrease um, secretion. Now, the sympathetic effects tend to last longer, like I mentioned earlier, than the um, parasympathetic effects. And the acetylcholine um, are going to be released by the parasympathetic um, and is broken down quickly at the synapse. And then the ME, which is our um, nor epinephrine. They are broken down. They are uh, by the released by the parasympathetics, and they're going to be reabsorbed by the nerve, diffusing the um, to the adjacent tissues, and some of them passed into the bloodstream. Now, what are the subdivisions we went over of the ANS? They are the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is, is our flight or fight and our parasympathetic that deals with rest and digestion digestion now I'll just look at a few organs in the body and the responses when it comes to sympathetic and parasympathetic in the eye well the iris can say in the iris but the iris when we look at the iris with a sympathetic type of response what will happen to the iris is it going to dilate or is it going to constrict? And what's going to happen with a parasympathetic response? With a sympathetic response we're going to have pupil dilation, parasympathetic constriction. But that's salivary glands, sympathetic and parasympathetic. You have uh, fixed saliva production and then you have thin saliva production. With heart, of course, with the sympathetic, as I said, is dealing with fire and flight. You're going to have an increase in heart rate and, of course, in, in, in the force. 
and then opposite reactions with our parasympathetic. Our lungs, you're going to have bronchodilation. So you're going to have a, uh, the bronchus going to be open a lot more just to ensure we have sufficient airflow to the proper bronchi. And parasympathetic is going to be bronchoconstriction. With the skin, what do you think will happen? We'll have basal constriction for our sympathetic and basal dilation for our parasympathetic. For the stomach, what do you think will happen? We'll have decreased peristalsis, peristalsis sorry, and, um, and with our parasympathetic, we'll have um, gastric secretion of our gastric juices. With our liver, we have an increased conversion of glycogen to glucose. So if you're running away, of course you're going to need more glucose to be converted to ATP so that you can uh, get away as fast as you want to get away. So that glycogen which is stored in the liver uh, needs to be converted to glucose. And um, for our parasympathetic, we have um, glycogen synthesis. Our kidneys, we're going to have a decrease in urine output. But in our parasympathetic, there's no effect. And then penal and clitoral um, erection. For sympathetic, there is no effect at all. In our parasympathetic, you'll have stimulation. Now with um, dural innervation. Now most viscera have dural innervation. That is that they're going to receive nerve fibers from both sympathetic and parasympathetic di divisions. These divisions may have either antagonistic or cooperative effects on a single organ. And we we'll look at the antagonistic effects. They are going to oppose each other. For example, the sympathetic division is going to speed up the heart, but the parasympathetic is going to slow it down. In some cases, these effects are due to dual innervation on the same effector cells, effector cells um, as in the heart. In other cases, each division um, are going to innervate different effectors, effector cells having an opposite um, effect. For example, the sympathetic fibers are going to innervate the, the palatory um, dilator and the parasympathetic fibers are going to innervate the constrictor. Now with the cooperative effects, they're going to, that occurs when the two divisions Act on, a diff act on different effectors to produce a unified overall effect. For example, in salivation, you have parasympathetic fibers that are going to stimulate the serous cells of the glands, while sympathetic fibers are going to stimulate mucous cells of the same gland. Now, unequal, unequal influence also occurs, such as in the wall and the digestive tract where the parasympathetic fibers um, predominate or the ventricles of the heart where the sympathetic input um, predominates. Alright, so let's look at the antagonistic effects again. We said it's going to oppose each other, correct? So when they oppose each other, they're going to exert um, dual innervation of the same effector cells. So what was the example I gave? We gave a heart rate, a heart rate will decrease with the parasympathetic division, but then with a sympathetic division, what's going to happen with the heart rate? It will increase. Now exerted because on each division is going to innervate different um, different cells. So that's in certain cases can have them um, acting on different cells having an opposite effect. So you have uh, pupillary dilator muscles which are um, sympathetic. And they're going to dilate right here. <laughs> See he's opening all the way. Dilate the, uh, the pupils. But then you have the constrictor um, pupillae. Those are going to constrict the pupils. That's our parasympathetic, um, parasympathetic action. 
and go over cooperative again. Cooperative effects is when two divisions they act on different effectors to produce a unified effect. For example, you have the parasympathetics. They're going to increase the um, the salivary serous cell secretion. So you're going to have more saliva coming from this particular cell. And the sympathetic, they're going to increase saliva or mucus from um, the mucus cells. So two different, two different um, divisions working together so that we can accomplish a particular goal. So just in the digestion, you're going with um, when we get to the digestive chapter, I don't, forget, I don't remember what chapter that is. But when we get to um, digestion, we realize that digestion takes part takes place in in the oral cavity. We have the salivation occurring to help moisten the food and break the chemicals within. Are going to break it down, and that's where we're talking about with <coughs> sorry with a cooperative effect. Both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic are being used to secrete the serous or the saliva to increase saliva from two different cells for the, the serous cell and the mucus cell so we have cell, um, saliva to help with the digestion and the moisten of, of the food and here's just an example that your book has on um, pupil dilation and as well as pupil constriction and this is dealing with dual innervation so would it be a cooperative effect or would it be an antagonistic effect? This would definitely be an antagonistic effect because you're having the opposite reaction occurring from the two different systems, the two different effects, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The parasympathetic is, doing, is, is um, causing pupil constriction and the sympathetic is causing pupil dilation. Now, in some cases, the autonomic nervous system can produce opposing effects without dual innovation. So, some of them are just going to receive um, sympathetic fibers. Now, the adrenal medulla, the para, the um, erector pilum muscles, the sweat glands, and um, many blood vessels, they're only going to receive, this is just a few examples of, the, of those fibers that are just going to receive sympathetic fibers. The most significant example is the regulation of blood pressure and the routes of blood flow. Now, um, sympathetic fibers to the blood vessels, they're going to keep the blood vessels in a state of partial constriction called vasomotor tone. Now, in um, some of the, it will have an increase in firing rate constrict, constricts the vessel, the, sorry, the vessel by increasing smooth muscle contract, contraction is going to decrease in firing which is going to allow the smooth muscle to relax and the blood and the vessels to dilate so your increase in firing will cause vasoconstriction and your decrease in firing will cause vasodilation now sympathetic control other vasomotor tone can shift blood uh, flow from one organ to another, such as increased dilation of the arteries of the of the arteries to the skeletal muscles and the heart under any type of emergency stress or or exercise. At the same time, it's going to constrict the arteries to the gastrointestinal and the urinary system as they are not essentially under such cons um, under conditions. So under stress, we're going to have blood vessels to the muscles and to the heart. They're going to dilate, and that's to make sure you have sufficient blood flow to the uh, particular, to the, to the active muscles, as you would say. Then, of course, to the skin itself, you have a uh, vasoconstriction, because basically you don't need the skin at that point in time. Now, don't forget when they say vasoconstriction, not saying completely shut off. It's just 
closed slightly so you're going to still have blood flow to those areas just not as much as before now the sympathetic division it prioritizes blood vessels to the skeletal muscle and in the heart in case of emergency like i stated now blood vessels to the skin what are they going to do I said it on the last slide what's it going to happen what's going to happen with that we're going to have vasoconstriction that's to make sure we have minimal bleeding if the injury um, occurs during stress or during exercise. Now, in spite of its name, the ANS is not independent. All of its output obviously is going to come from a CNS. And it is influenced by other levels of the nervous system. The cerebral cortex, for example, it influences the ANS through thoughts and motion such as anger, fear, and desire, just to name a few. Now the limbic system is involved in many emotional responses and has extensive connections with the hypothalamus. The limbic system has uh, thus provides a pathway connecting sensory mental experiences with the autonomic nervous system. The major control the major control center of the visceral motor center is the hypothalamus. This region contains many nuclei for um, primitive functions such as hunger, thirst, emotions, and sexuality. Output from the hypothalamus, it travels to the nuclei in many um, caudal regions of the brainstem and from there to the cranial nerves and the sympathetic regions in the spinal cord. Now the ANS is regulated also, I mean just a continuation of that, we have the midbrain pons and the medulla oblongata. They're going to house several autonomic nuclei, of which many belong to the particular formation, which extends from the medulla to the hypothalamus. So they're going to regulate swallowing, um, bladder control, salivation, also sweating. The um, autonomic re reflexes such as defecation, um, micturation, erection, ejaculation are integrated in the spinal cord. The brain can inhibit um, defecation and, urina and urination um, consciously, but the spinal cord is severed. Spinal reflexes allow con uh, own, um, Spinal reflexes alone control these functions. So here we're going to deal with, um, just touch on neuropharmacology. What is neuropharmacology? The study of effects on the nervous, the study of drug effects on the nervous system. Now we have the, sorry for my pronunciation, my, uh, my, Sim sympathomimics mimics 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 I'm sorry <laughs> it enhances the, the sympathetic activity it's going to mimic the effects of transmitter substances of the sympathetic nervous system as catecholamines and those are norepinephrine epinephrine and our dopamine they're going to act at the post ganglion sympathetic terminal either going to directly activate directly activate postsynaptic receptors um, block and break down and of course uh, reuptake they may stimulate production and the release of catecholamines um, they will stimulate uh, receptors or increase norepinephrine release such as uh, cold medicines that would dilate the the bronchioles or constrict nasal uh, blood vessels and are used to treat cardiac arrest, hypertension, or even delay premature labor. Now to continue with my um, sympathomimetics, uh, we have those that are direct, that act directly on the cause or act indirectly. We have our adrenergic um, receptor agonists. 
And these are just a few that I pulled out of um, doing some extra research to put in here for you guys, especially for those that are going into nursing. These are very important um, drugs that you have to know or should know that you will definitely see later. So um, this last one here, the um, dobutamine, dobutamine um, they're going to treat heart failure and any um, cardiogenic shock. And we have some that are going to decrease the uh, cardiac, the bradycardia, break, which is slow heart rate. Some will treat the same one, also treat um, heart block and as well as asthma. So those are going to um, react directly on, on the problem. Some are going to um, direct, act indirectly are those norepinephrine and our dopamine transmitter um, blockers, which are phetamines and cocaine. They act by blocking and reversing the norepinephrine transmitter activity. So they're just going to block the receptors. They're not really actually going to treat the problem. Now the third one would be our second one. Sorry, is our sympatho sympatholytics, and they're going to suppress the sympathetic activity. So they're going to suppress all the the exciting things, the fight or the flight. So they're going to inhibit the pulse ganglic functions of the SNS, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, the block receptors or inhibit the norepinephrine release. So beta blockers, because everybody, hopefully everybody has heard of beta blockers before. Before they're going to reduce the high blood pressure, interfering with the um, effects of epinephrine and or norepinephrine on the heart and on the blood vessels. You have alpha blockers, which are used to treat anxiety and and of course panic. Um, clonidine, which is used to um, clonidine, and this other one here, guanf guanfacine, they're used to um, help decrease the release of this norepinephrine in the brain. Now, our parasympatho um, mimic mimetics, <laughs> they enhance activity while parasympathetics are going to suppress activity. Now, many drugs also act as neurotransmitters in the CNS, such as Prozac, and they're there to block the retake of serotonin to prolonging its mood elevating effects. Now we have caffeine. Caffeine is, is an example of the very last one we we're talking about. Um, caffeine, it compensates, sorry not compensates, it competes with adenosine by binding to its receptors. And it's, it increases the alertness, as you see right here. <laughs> increases alertness, increases memory attention, decreases risk of, but it decreases the risk of, of um, heart disease, but that's only in moderation. But what's the side effects? We have anxiety, anxiety, increased vasoconstriction and blood pressure, um, reduced control of fine motor movement and stimulation of, of urination. Now you may ask, how is it possible that it's going to decrease your risk of heart disease, but then it's going to the side effect will be to increase vasoconstriction and blood pressure. Just remember, everything in moderation. Some doctors are prescribing, are telling heart patients that it's okay to drink a little bit of alcohol, but then we we understand the effects of alcohol on on the blood and our on our cardiac patients. So just one one glass a, a week or a small glass of, of, of wine a day is, is okay when it's really not in the long run. So if you have any questions pertaining to this chapter you know what to do. Go to the discussion board um, and blackboard and post any questions that you may have concerning this chapter.